First Lady Quincy Wright. Since I have been in Knoxville, she has been mom to me. I don't have any blood family here, but I got family here. Because of Bishop Wright, Lady Wright, and then of course my Kingdom Life family. I'm going to say it again, all 5,000 of Kingdom couldn't be here tonight. But we thank God for the remnant that is here. Um, before I go any further, I do want to extend prayers. Matter of fact, let's do that now. Because there was a horrible shooting that took place right here in our city in one of our schools. I was talking to one of my friends and I was talking to Brother Daniel. Yesterday before service, the Lord put a very heavy impression on my heart. And I began to pray against violence and gang violence in particular and things of that nature. And we were asking God to move because I sensed something in the atmosphere. And see, you understand, you know, in church we say, oh, it's praying time. Baby, it's been praying time. It's been praying time. The problem is the church is just now catching up with the idea of what, the what time it really is. So it's definitely time to pray. Let's go before God right now in regard to that. Father, in the name of Jesus. Those of you that have your prayer language, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. In the name of Jesus. God, we stand together in agreement for this city. We take authority in the name of Jesus over the spirit of violence and murder in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we ask for a strategy to bring change, bring change, bring change. Father, our prayer tonight is that the power not just be in the pulpit and we can preach all day and be happy but god take us deeper than just a sermon take us into a place where we're so tapped into heaven that we know what to do how to move how to function in the name of jesus today we bind the hand of the enemy and we release god your hand upon this city to bring freedom to bring deliverance to bring breakthrough in the name of Jesus Father we pray for those families that are in concern about their loved ones that were involved in what happened today Father I even pray for the trauma come on help me praise I am we pray concerning the trauma. Mm. We pray concerning the trauma that people are dealing with right now as a result of what happened today. We come, God, we pray for those that are dealing with trauma. God, we're asking you in the name of Jesus to move now, God. You can't just see death happen. You can't just see shootings happen and not do something on the inside of you. Father, we pray concerning the trauma. We pray now, God, that you would bind up the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. The enemy would love to introduce fear into the atmosphere of our schools. Introduce fear to the parents that they can't send their children to school without there being issues and problems. But in the name of Jesus, we take authority even over the spirit of fear. Yes. And we declare in Jesus' name that things are changing. Things are changing. Things are changing in the mighty 
name of Jesus. And God, we even pray for those who have become so callous to these kinds of events that they don't bother them at all. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give folks a heart again. In the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you now. We thank you now for sending your angels. We send angels. We dispatch angels. Come on, help me, Zion, right here. We dispatch angels into the school system, not just here in Knoxville, but all across our nation. We dispatch angels to protect our children in the name of Jesus. Hey, 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 hey. We send warring angels now in the name of Jesus to do battle in the name of Jesus. Fight back the forces of darkness in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, God, as we go into this time of service tonight, I ask you in the name of Jesus to move by your power. In the name of Jesus, move by your strength. In the name of Jesus, speak to your people. In the name of Jesus, give us hearts to receive what the Spirit of the Lord would say unto us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that agrees, shout amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. Come on, clap those hands and give God glory. Amen. Come on, you just say clap him. I said, and give him glory. The Bible says, offer unto God the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of your lips. I dare you to clap your hands and... That's it. That's it. I feel the atmosphere shifting now. I feel the atmosphere shifting now. I feel it shifting. Come on, shift this atmosphere in here. Let the enemy know he's defeated in this atmosphere. Come on, Zion, raise your voices in here. Come on, Zion, raise your voices in here. Come on, Zion, raise your voices in here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you praise, God. We give you praise. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, somebody, bless the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody, bless the name of Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. He's a great I am. He's the matchless lamb, and we give him glory. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord Jesus. We bless your name, God. Hallelujah. Our shield of the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm trying to move, but I feel it right there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's breakthrough in the room. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory, 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 God. We give you majesty, praise, and honor, oh God. We render unto you glory, oh God, because you are worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It feels like revival in here. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. We thank you, 
Come on here, mother. Come on here. Yeah.
I want to go quickly to Philippians chapter number three. What is a very familiar passage of scripture, if you would, if you have the ability as we read the word of God to rest on your feet in honor of the reading of the word of God. Philippians chapter 3, if you have it, would you say amen? amen. If you don't have it, say hold on just a minute. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Reading from the King James, very familiar passage, says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me. Those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb. Skybalon, that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in, through, through, excuse me, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul says here that I may know him, come on here, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. But I follow after. Somebody say I follow after. I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto the things which are before, concluding with verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Thus far the reading of the word of God. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. On your way down if you don't mind helping me to bring emphasis to my message today. Thank you brother Steve. If you don't mind helping me bring emphasis to my message. Say these words. The passion, the passion. and the press. And the, press. Oh, Lord. the passion and the press. Come on, say that with me one more time. The passion, the passion. And, and the press. the press. Let me just taxi down the runway. I promise you we're going to take off in a little while, but I need to work. Is that all right? Do I have a talk back church tonight? Last night we began revival and and many of you may not have seen it, those that are watching by social media, 
But I shared a very important principle that revival is not what a lot of people think that revival is. Uh, those of us that may have grown up in church, we know, we've know we known revival to be a special time of the year where we call in some special preacher to come preach and they say something that excites us, makes us feel good, maybe go home with a little something, but after it's all said and done, next year, the same time as the old, old, old uh, TV program says, same bat time, same bat channel. And I said last night that there are others who have the misconception of revival, thinking that revival is when we start to see mass salvations and mass healings and mass deliverances breaking out. And I said, unfortunately, that's not what revival is. That's a crusade. That's a crusade. Now, I know there are folk out there in social media land who might get mad with me for saying that, but we got to stop saying uh, just, Lord, send revival to our land. When we talk about revival, if we're going to ask for revival, we've got to be asking for the right thing. All right, all right, all right. But it should not be. Now, see, oh, my, help me, Lord, I hear you. It should not be that we always have to ask God to send revival to the church. The reason why we should not always have to ask God to send revival to the church, because if the church is doing it right, the church will stay alive anyway. If we're really hungry, we won't find ourselves constantly in need of revival. In fact, if we really get hungry enough, if we stayed connected to the fire, then our fire would connect to the fire of our brother or our sister, and all of a sudden we'll mess around and have a wildfire going on, and God will break out in our city, in our country, and even around the world. Amen. Amen. The problem is we can't seem to keep, ch keep church folk. Come on. on fire. Come on. Tell it good. Yes, sir. Come on. We always got to preach to you. And the least little thing. Okay, let me let me not get ahead of my message. Let me leave that alone. But I needed to set that groundwork again tonight because I need you all to understand I'm not here as Bishop Long tonight. I'm here as Apostle Long tonight to speak some things and to begin to set some things in order in the spirit and even concerning the body of Christ that have been out of alignment for a long time. I'm grateful that we have uh, technological means like social media to share stuff like this. And those of you that are watching, I'm going to encourage you to share it on your page because I got some stuff to say tonight. So... This is my taxi down the runway. <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, I remember, and I don't think there's any one of us who has ever stayed up late at night, Brother Daniel. Uh, I don't think there's any one of us who's ever stayed up at night who has a TV, who has not seen a infomercial, especially back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, where they were advertising evangelists, they were advertising this rotisserie oven. It was called the Showtime Home Rotisserie Oven. And there was a man by the name of Ron Papil who helped to make this rotisserie oven popular. He'd be on there, they'd, be, they'd have these 30 minute or an hour long infomercials and I found out, I did some research, and I found out that between 1998, when they first introduced these rotisserie ovens, through 2001, they sold to over 2.5 million units of that rotisserie oven. And they made about $400 million <laughs> off that rotisserie oven. The popularity, God, I feel like preaching tonight. Yeah. The popularity of that particular rotisserie oven came in part, Sister Rosalind, because of a special phrase that Ron Papil used in the infomercial. 
The phrase that he used in the infomercial was one that everybody could remember. I don't even know if he did it on purpose, but once he did it, it caught on and he did it regularly. He said, all you got to do is put your food in the rotisserie, turn the dial, and then set it and forget it. Wow. Y'all remember that commercial, don't you? He would say, put your food in. Turn the dial. Set it. And what? And forget it. What I've discovered, ladies and gentlemen, is it appears that the enemy has taken a cue from Ron Pompeo and introduce this concept subtly to the church. Yeah, he's introduced this concept subtly to the church. And over the ages, people have bought into the concept of set it and forget it. Let me work my way up to that spot if you don't mind. Paul opens Philippians chapter 3 talking to them he says uh, finally he gives them a word he says rejoice in the Lord now understand when you really study the background of him using that terminology rejoice in the Lord literally saints of God what he was saying it was kind of like what they would use as a closing farewell to people so they thought you would think that what he was writing was the closure of this particular passage but it seemed like something happened that ignited something down in Paul that he couldn't just quite close it right there uh, in the in in the, the, in Rome, if you y'all my, my 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 King of Life folks should know about this. In Rome, in Rome, there were Judaizers who came to the Roman Church trying to put people in bondage, making them believe that in order to be born again, in order to be right, you had to do it according to the Jewish culture and the Jewish way. Ah, oh, you had to fulfill all of the works of the law along with Christ if you were going to try. There was a mixture thing going on. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, Paul was saying to them, I don't want you to get to be like those Judaizers. First, he says, beware of dogs. Beware of dogs. Now, I've heard this passage preached and people have used all kind of stuff to talk about the dogs. In the Old Testament, one of the references of dogs, one of the references of dogs in the Old Testament was to false prophets. Y'all going to help me work tonight? Beware of dogs. Mm -hmm. Too many people, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand and look right in this camera tonight, and I'm going to say it. Now, if you're in here, you go ahead and grab it too. Too many people are running to the folk that can call your name, your address, and your phone number. All because it seems sensational for them to do that. Now, I'm not judging anybody that may have that gift in God, but my question is, what spirit is motivating the gift that they are using? Come on, you better say it. Just because they can call out your name, your address, and your phone number doesn't mean that that gift is coming from God. Come on, you better say it. Hello, hello, Richie, come on. It feels real good when they can do all that stuff. And see, what happens is we run the danger of when somebody is not a prophet who calls out your name, your address, and phone number, you think they're less spiritual than the one who does. Listen, see, now I'm going to get in trouble right here. But some of the stuff y'all call it prophecy ain't prophecy anyway. So what y'all are really getting is word of knowledge and calling it prophetic. Yeah, I'm going to do the best I can. 
You're getting word of knowledge but calling it prophetic. No, baby. Word of knowledge is the ability to know things that happen in that's happening in your present or in your past by the Spirit of God. The danger is you can also get that by divination. You can also get that by demon power. The prophetic unction, the prophetic unction, now see, I don't have time to dig into all of this tonight, y'all pull it on me, but the prophetic unction, there's a difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. Oh God, I'm trying to preach my sermon, y'all messing me up tonight, but we got a whole bunch of folk, I don't know what happened, but somehow, 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 it got real popular to be either a prophet or an apostle. Y'all not hearing me. It became real popular. Folk wanted, you know, they, they, they love being prophet flip-flop and uh, apostle watermelon. Huh? Come on. Because for some reason, everybody wants recognition. You can't get recognition in any other area of your life. You don't have anybody calling you out and treating you special in any other area of your life. So you got to go to church and get a title on your name so you can feel like you're somebody special. So they're going to escort you to the front. Baby, listen, your mindset is wrong and you need to be healed for real. need to be healed for real. There's a prophetic that is for exhortation, edification, and comfort. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? But then when we start talking about the office of a prophet, the office of a prophet walks differently. It begins to see future events. It begins to foretell, and I'm not talking about fortune tell. See, the reason why some of y'all run into some of these meetings, because you want a fortune teller to read your fortune. Well, I'm going to read your fortune right here. Pick up your Bible. Read your Bible for yourself. You want for some reason, we want the easy way. Come on. You want me to get up here, read your life story, and tell you everything's going to be better, and that's that. I'm going to tell you as of tonight, you need to pick up your Bible, read your Bible for yourself, and the way things are going to turn is not just because I pronounce them turning, but they're going to turn because you read the Word and believe the Word of God. I might be making faces, but I'm not mad, y'all. I love you. But we got false prophets. And the church has so little discerning that they don't know what's real and what's fake anymore. If the popular, uh-oh, I'm going to get in trouble right here. If the popular people say that so-and-so is anointed, then they must be right, and so this person must be anointed. No, let me help you. They're just gifted, not anointed. will destroy yokes. Something's going to be changed on the inside of you when you've been under an anointing. But when you just gift it, all a gift will do is entertain you. Yes, sir. You preach it. Come on now. Do you not know that there are formulas that people put together to teach you how to preach? You can go to YouTube right now and look up hoopology and there is even a thing to show you how to learn how to tune up and hoop. For those of y'all that don't know what hooping is, oh Lord, oh Lord. Yeah. Yeah. We got you. 
Literally, you can look on YouTube right now. And I'm not speaking bad about the person who taught it because he was a master hoopologist, as they say. He was a good hooper. Great preacher. But there were preachers who wanted to learn how to hoop. Because that's a, that's a part of the African American culture. I'm not doubting hooping because y'all, y'all fool with me. I'll hoop every now and then. I, tell, I went to a church not too long ago. I told them, I said, I appreciate y'all letting me be. They was all white church predominantly. I said, I appreciate y'all letting me be me. If I, just, if I get to a place where I start hollering, y'all just let me holler. That's a part of my culture. I leave me alone. I got to work my way through this. Yeah. Beware of dogs. Yeah. We got a whole lot of folk that are running behind all this extra stuff that we shouldn't be running behind. So Paul tells them, stop running behind the dogs. Watch out for the dogs. Uh -huh. Not only was he talking about false prophets, but he was also talking about these Judaizers that were coming in to try and bring division among the body of Christ. Watch this. Then he says, beware of evil workers. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Come on. Now, this is about to get good. All right. Now, what we think is evil workers is not literally what Paul was talking about when he said evil workers. Now, we think we start reading the scriptures and we say, and, and see, I love Pastor Mike Lloyd. That's my that's my preaching coach, Pastor Michael Lloyd. He te he's he's even teaching our classes. And, and let me tell you something. He's been getting us. And one of the things he tells you is you can't just read the surface of a text. That's right. right. You got to dig deeper. And so it makes for good preaching when we say, beware of evil workers. Watch out for folks who do bad stuff. We know that. But when Paul was talking about beware of evil workers, it was because they boasted in their religious standing. Yes. Come on. Say it again. Okay. I didn't say this on camera last night, but I'm going to say it on camera tonight. One of the most dangerous spirits that operates, particularly in the church. See, we worry about Jezebel. Uh huh. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. We worry about spirits of lust and perversion. Come on. I mean, those are very real. Don't get me wrong. I'm not reducing those, but there's a spirit that we ignore. And you know why we tend to ignore it? Because so many people got it. Jesus have mercy. It's called a religious yeah. spirit. Yeah. Come on. And within the religious spirit, it causes you to do what you know to do, what you've been trained to do. You know how to have church. You know when to buck. You know when to bend. You know when to eat come a shy. You know when to clap your hands. You know when to do all of that stuff. But we got something else going on. Well, the religious spirit also produces in us a self righteousness. Self righteousness. So it makes you put yourself above other people. Come on, come on, come on. Can I work tonight, y'all? Makes you put yourself above other people. And then the crazy thing is you will say out of your mouth, I don't see myself better than anybody else. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh God. Oh yeah, we will say, I don't see myself. I, I don't think I'm any better than anybody else. But the truth of the matter is you old self-righteous, mean-hearted demon. Come on, preach that thing. Yes, sir. Why has the church, I was sitting at the computer today, thank you Holy Ghost for bringing that back to me. I was sitting at my computer today, Evangelist, and while I was sitting there, the Holy Ghost said, the church has taken major losses because of religious spirits, because people have taken on the, the concept and the spirit of self-righteousness. They believe yourself to be so wonderful and so good in God that what you have created is an environment that is works-based that your salvation is based on how good you are. Listen, let me help all of y'all out and help us, oh God. Let me help everybody out. No matter how good you are, you can never be good enough for long enough to merit the grace of God. God, I feel this in here. You can 
might never be good enough for long enough to merit the grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, not one of us in here could be saved. Well now, why is it that this self-righteous demon will cause people in the church to try to make people live up to their standards? Now, I am not saying that you should not endeavor to live before the Lord a holy lifestyle. Before anybody gets confused and say the bishop, the apostle got up here and he was preaching old greasy grace. Say you can live any kind of way. That is not what I said. Don't you go out of here. Don't you get off this line lying on me. I did not say you can live any kind of way. But I got one problem. The church people who are bound by religion try to dictate to folk what their process should be. Come on now. That's the truth. That's right. So, oh God. Mama, you got me tonight. I got you. <laughs> so what we have created is a people who live to make change from the outside but never get changed on the inside. I feel an anointing in here tonight to break the bondage off of some folk who've been living under the bonds of church people who made you feel like you got to live according to their standard. No, I speak in the name of Jesus that you be set free tonight by the power of the blood of the Lamb. Whatever God's got to do, let him do it from the inside out and not from the outside in. God have mercy. I feel people watching me, whether you're in here or out there, who are being set free. Woo, somebody give God a praise for freedom. People are being set free from the bondage of what other folk got to say. Yes, yes, yes. Really? Yeah. See, this religious spirit, it gets a hold of folk and try to make them, make you have to live up to their standards. Well, no more will you have to live up to anybody else's. Here's what I believe and here's what I stand on. The Holy Ghost is big enough to convict me of the stuff he needs to convict me of. He's big enough to convict you of the stuff that he needs to convict you of. Now the only thing you got to do is listen to him. If you get in his presence, if you get in his face, he'll talk to you about you. I don't need the church folk to get in. You won't need the church folk to get in your face all the time telling you your cleavage is too low, your dress is too high, your pants are too tight. Because when you got the real Holy Ghost, he'll talk to you. He'll, he'll tell you if it ain't for sale anymore, take the sign down. I'm talking about real Holy Ghost. He'll tell you, take the sign down. If you don't lie no more, if you know lying is bad, the real Holy Ghost will deal with you about your lying problem. You won't be comfortable telling lies and then believe your own lie. When they, oh Lord Jesus, help me. When they slide up in your DMs trying to get you to commit adultery, you won't want to commit adultery. You'll be saying, you know what, baby? You might be fine, you might be cute, but you ain't worth what God is taking his time to play in my life. Somebody shout glory. They boasted because of their religious standing. Evil workers. Evil workers. 
Isn't it amazing that what God calls evil? Yes, Lord. Uh, a little bit different from what we seem to call evil. That's right. Come on. Evil workers, he said, those of y'all that's boasting in your own flesh. Uh -huh. <laughs> boasting in your own works. Talking about how saved you are. I've been in church for 50 years. Listen, you've been in church for 50 years, but God ain't been in you. But I know how to pray. Yeah, you know how to pray because you watch grandmama them pray. That's right. Come on, come on. You know how to worship. No, you're not really in the heart of worship. You just know how to lift your hands and cry because the music made you feel good. Preach yeah. long. I, I think I will tonight, y'all. Yeah, because see, you ain't got to have worship music to make you cry. You can play the right kind of music on a good day and you will sit right in your car with tears streaming down your face. So don't make the mistake that the mistake of thinking that just because you came to church and they played the right chords and you began to cry that you were in worship. No, baby, worship is a state of the heart that is focused on Him. Uh oh, I'm digging in a whole lot of stuff tonight. I feel it. See, you think because worship came and, and because the music started playing and it made you feel better because you were going through problems and troubles and struggles and it made you feel better, you must have went in, gone into worship. No, that wasn't worship, baby. Worship is when you take the focus off of you, off of your stuff, and off of what you've been going through in your life. And you say, God, in spite of... You're still good in spite of God. You're still worthy in spite of God. You're still the great God. And I will bless the Lord at all times. Beware of dogs, evil workers, and the concision. Those who tear up. The church. Dogs, evil workers, and those who are of the concision, those who tear up the church. And the crazy thing is, y'all ready for this? There are folk who are still sitting right up in the church who are tearing up the church. And won't leave the church. Because my grandmama got a pew with a plaque on it. Because there's a stained glass window with in memory of on it. Well, 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 well. I got to bend this corner. Y'all y'all playing with me. Y'all got me working. Okay. Mm. But that's what happens, folks. Forget, they'll be sitting right up in the church, causing division in the church. Be in the praise team. They'll stay in the praise team, but they'll pressure you until you get off the praise team. They'll sit and talk bad about the pastor until they get you to leave the church, but they won't leave the church and will sit there and then talk to somebody else bad about the pastor. But I don't understand why he get the salary he gets or why she get the money that she get. You know all them preachers ain't got nothing but money. Well, let me just help some of y'all. There are those of us out there who are not in it for the income. We're in it for the outcome. Thank you, Pastor Carolyn Jones. First Lady Wright is sitting right here in this sanctuary. She'll tell you, I have never tripped over what the church has given me. Well, listen, we got a small church. We got a growing church. But listen, I've never tripped over what the church has given me. The church has done the best it can. But listen, I'm not in it for the income. I press just as hard and give everything I got to do what I can to empower the people of Kingdom Life Church because I love what I'm called to do and it's not about a dollar bill. Oh, but there's still folk that will run their mouth and say, I don't see why he get. They'll tell you, no, 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 I'm going I'm to I'm I'm mess something up right here. 
I'm almost there. I'm almost to the rest of my sermon. I'm almost there, but I'm, I'm going to tell y'all something. See, and, and one of the reasons why they say don't go to those revivals, don't go to, don't, don't go to those services and, and give your money. They tell you don't go in there giving your money because, you know, they only came in there just to raise it. Now, there are some churches where they do this to raise an offering. Y'all quiet on me. Come on, you're telling the truth. Oh, they put together whole services just so they can raise some money. That's Have whole revivals just so they can raise some money. Preachers will put y'all in a $100 line and tell y'all 40 of y'all need to give $100 just so they... Watch this. Just so they can count and see how many folk are in the line so they know what, how much money they're going to take home from that night. I said it and before I take it back, I'll add more to it. I don't care who doesn't like me because I tell the truth. They teach young preachers how to manipulate folk to raise offerings. They teach young preachers how to do that. But when you get up, you, you wait till, and, and have y'all noticed, I, I, I got to get to my sermon, y'all, get to the rest of it. Have y'all noticed, they wait till the folk get to shouting, and that's when they want to raise the offering? Uh-huh. It's because chemical endorphins are going through your brain at that moment, so you're not thinking straight. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not kidding. That's right. They wait till they get you at a high, then they raise the offering, so your endorphins are moving through you, real, and so you're not thinking straight so all of a sudden you go get your bill money out the ATM and now churches are so technologically advanced you don't even have to go to the ATM you can decide your debit card how much you want to give but I'm going to give 500 I'm going to believe God knowing that's your light bill and God didn't tell you to give it the preacher told you to give it now if God tells you to give it then God is obligated to take care of your needs you shouldn't be have to come back to the church three days later talking about, can y'all help me with my light bill, please? Yes. 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 Mama, what's on me tonight? Yes. Woo! <laughs> Folk go and they get, go to the go to the ATM machine and do all this and they're giving their bill money knowing it's not God and they say well God's going to bless no God's not blessing you because you did some foolishness so Paul then very quickly I'm going to move through this Paul then begins to say he says don't take any confidence in your flesh what he was talking about was he was saying don't take confidence in your flesh it's in your ability to live this thing out by your own ways by your own fleshly patterns. You can't do it. And I don't care how much you try. No good thing dwells in the flesh. Thank you, Bible readers, for helping me. No good thing dwells within our flesh. But then, ladies and gentlemen, he talks about being apprehended by something. I heard when I was a little boy, there was a little song they used to sing. They said something. Mm, got a hold of me. Something got a hold of y'all know what I'm talking about. Paul was saying something got a hold of me. The knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ got a hold of me. This relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ got a hold of me. Is there anybody in here who can testify something got a hold? Oh, there's proof that something got a hold of me. And I know when I say something, I'm talking about capital S something, not small S something. Ah, I'm talking about the power of the Most High God. Got a hold. Is there anybody in here who can testify? There's proof that something got a hold of me. Because when I would have cussed you out. Help me, Lord, I feel it in here tonight. When I would have cussed you out, when I would have went down the wrong road, when I would have did some crazy stuff, ah, something got a, y'all better be glad, something got a hold of me. It keeps me, sometimes can we be honest, when I don't want to be kept. Y'all not hollering back at me up in here. So, I got to bend this corner around third base so we can get out of here. Uh, Because I ain't going to keep you long on this revival. But watch this. He talks about, I've been apprehended Mm -hmm. 
of something. I've been placed, I told Shakandi to the Osha, under arrest. Somebody say, my life is under arrest. I'm free, but I'm under arrest. My heart is under arrest. Who is it under arrest by? By the Lord Jesus Christ. His love has arrested. Can I preach like a feeling in here tonight? Have you been have you ever fallen in love with somebody? And when you were really, really in love with them, there's something about just everything about them that just did something to you. You would think about them in the middle of the day and it would make you start smiling. You would think about them late at night and you would say, I've had to call you just to hear your voice. You'd be laying there and y'all be sleepy as all get out and say, hang up the phone. No, you hang up the phone. You sleep? No. You didn't want to hang up the phone. You wanted, You just laid there and listened to each other breathe. Why? Because you had been arrested by the love of the individual. Well, ladies and gentlemen, is there anybody in here who can say, I've been arrested? By the love of Jesus, he loved me so much. It wasn't because I loved him first, but it was because he first loved me. Say yeah, yeah. I got to bend this. So I need y'all to get this. I can't get you just to get excited. You got to hear this. Watch. So then he goes from there and he talks about, I count myself not to I've apprehended. I ain't all the way there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, he's still working on me. Yes. Amen. Uh, he said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Yeah, yeah. Now, when we have preached this text, we've talked about this text from the place of our problems. Come on here. We've talked about this thing in regard to all of the outward things that have happened in our lives. Well, I come to tell you, he says, I'm forgetting the things that are behind me. And I'm reaching for to the things that are before me. Y'all, I got to get there now. I'm feeling myself going up the hill. I'm trying to tell you I'm reaching for the things that are before me. He said, I press. Somebody say, I press. Now, let me tell you, number one, many times that we have preached this thing, and we preached it talking about our problems. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, will problems, if you go through them right, will produce a press. Holler back at me up in here. Your problems, uh, if you end this thing, if you've really been apprehended by Christ Jesus and his love, it will produce a press. Uh, how will it produce a press? Because when I face problems, uh, I know who I can run to. Uh, when, 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 uh, when troubles surround me, uh, I can go to the rock. Uh, I go to the rock. Uh, I go to the rock. Uh, I know how to call it. Uh, when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me. Mm, behave long. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I've said this before, but let me encourage somebody. If you've got to the point where you've reached rock bottom, that's a good place to be because at least you're on the rock and you got somewhere. Let me behave. Oh it's just night number two. <laughs> but problems will produce a press. Yes, 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 <laughs> if I had never had a problem, yes. I would never know that God was able yes. to solve them. I heard the song say, I never know what faith in God could do. But through it all, oh, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Yes, I thank God for the hills and the valleys because it taught me how to pray. But no 
Number two, God, I got to move here. Not only will problems produce a press, but pain will produce a press. Hallelujah. Even sometimes the stuff that has been self-inflicted, the pain will produce a press. When you have been apprehended by the love of Jesus, when you have done some crazy stuff that has caused pain in your own life, you will find yourself pressing when you don't feel like pressing. You'll find yourself pushing when you don't feel like pushing. You'll find yourself saying, God, I missed it. I let the wrong joker in my space. Forgive me, Lord, and heal me for real. Am I talking to anybody in here? Pain will produce a press. The tears that you cry because y'all do understand that men born of a woman is of a few days and they are full of trouble. So you will experience some good days and you will experience some pain. But I got to let you know that if you get in it right, the pain will produce a press. I, 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 I don't understand all these folk who say I'm about to leave God because of the level of pain I've been in, because of all the struggle I've been in. Well, let me give you some hope. Many are, oh, I wish I had a church in here. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But, 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 but the Lord. Where's my old school church that know how to tune up with me? But the Lord delivers us out of them all. Say it. I've got to go in here, but I thank God for even the pain that I've gone through. I thank God that sometimes I had to hurt. I didn't understand it then, but it was working. was working for me a far exceeding weight of glory every tear I cried was working for me look around at somebody and tell them all neighbor it was working for me I didn't understand it then but it was working for me but wait a minute wait a minute it wasn't just working for me but it was working cause down the line somebody else was going to need the stuff that I've been through. Somebody else was going to need to know about the pain that I've been through. So I thank God. Thank But here's where I'm going to close. I'm going to close right here. Remember at the beginning of my message, y'all thought I forgot, I didn't forget. I talked about Ron Popeil and his mindset of set it and forget it. <laughs> hmm. It's one thing to have to press past pain. It's one thing to have to press past problems. But I submit to you that another part of this I press, watch this, is pressing past you. Bring me in, Steve. The other, real soft. The other part of this I press is the ability to press past you. Why do we seem to always need revival? Because we got folk who have become so complacent that they've taken their Christianity. And I, and I know some of y'all sitting here saying, well, that's not me. If you're still in the place where you have been and you've plateaued and this is just where you are, you're one of those folks that the enemy has crept in with a set it and forget it. You go to church every Sunday, set it and forget it. You go to Bible study on Wednesday or Thursday night, whatever night y'all have Bible study, set it, forget it. 
You ride down the street in your car. When you get up in the morning on your way to work, God, thank you for another day. Thank you for life, health, and strength. Keep my family. Keep us forward no more. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless my day. Make me have a good day, God. Set it and forget it. Some of us, the reason why we always got to have revival, quote, unquote, is because too many believers are comfortable with what their pastor is preaching. Y'all not hearing me tonight. Comfortable with what their pastor is preaching. And I'm not saying that it's wrong because the Bible talks about how can we hear without a preaching? How can they preach unless they've been sent? Yeah, we need those. Listen, if, if we stop needing preachers and pastors, I'm out of a job. But the reality is what the preachers are supposed to be doing is pointing you back to the book. You know why we got to have so many revivals? Because the Bible says study to show yourself approved. And most believers at best maybe read the Bible. I said at best you might read the Bible. But when it comes down to actually studying the word of God, you don't study. You don't know anything more than what your pastor told you. I don't want kingdom life to just know what I teach them. I tell them, go get in the book for yourself. Study, look deeper into it. But people don't want to do that. Because it's easier to just listen to the preacher. So, watch what I'm saying. See, we talk about the problems producing a press. The pain producing a press. But what about your passion producing a press? Remember at the beginning of this message, I told you I wanted you to repeat after me. And I said the passion and the press. Don't be the individual who just lets your problems cause a press. Don't just be the individual who lets pain cause your press. I'm encouraging another level in God tonight. I'm speaking into the atmosphere, those that are in this room and those that are watching by social media. I'm speaking into your life that it will no longer just be pain and problems that produce your press. But as of tonight, in the name of Jesus, if you will receive this word, it will be your passion. You know, Mr. Steve got the hoop triggers, and I did tune up for a minute, but I told him not to, not to use the hoop triggers. And there's a reason. Because I didn't want us to get so happy where we were ready to shout and all that stuff tonight. We might shout this week. But my goal is not to get you shouting. My goal is to challenge your walk with God so that you don't need me to come back this time next year and activate what you let die from this time this year. If I come back next year or whenever whenever y'all bring me back, it'll be because the Lord has ordained another moment, another divine connection moment. Not because you need me to speak revival into the atmosphere. The Lord challenged me today. He said, tell my people. They've let, we preach this. I mean, we get excited, prophetess. I mean, we we preach this and I press toward the mark. Doesn't matter what I've been through. I press, I mean, we get that thing. We, I mean, we dig in and we go for it. I press. I cried many tears, but I press. But we stayed on the surface level. We've all talked about, preachers, we've talked about the problems producing the press. 
We've talked about the pain producing the press, but we've never challenged the believer to let the passion produce the press. I'm done. But I need you to understand tonight that what has to happen in the body of Christ and the reason why we are so lethargic is because we've lost our fire. We don't have fire for God like we used to. Prove it, Bishop. We got to beg folk to come to church now. It don't take all of that. That's the mindset folk have now. It don't some <laughs> some folk couldn't handle the fact that we have a seven nights of revival. You know, today we only do three nights. Listen, some things you got to dig. Listen, I understand. In this seven nights, I've got to dig. I've got to plow. I've got to tear down some stuff, and then I got to build back up. And two to three nights just wasn't gonna do that. But because we have been, we've lost our passion. One of my favorite sermons I've ever preached in my closing tonight, y'all, one of my favorite sermons I've ever preached was keep tapping until it turns. Okay. Keep tapping until it turns. He talked about the prophet Elisha was about to die. He tells the king, shoot the arrow out the window. The, the king shoots the arrow. That was a sign of war, a, a declaration of war when they would shoot it out. And then he says, strike the ground with the rest of the arrows. Now, there's some uh, be uh, debate between the scholars of whether he meant strike it like this or shoot the arrows. It doesn't matter. The fact is, he struck the ground only three times and stopped. And the Bible said the prophet got mad with him and said you should have struck it five or six times because then you would have gotten total victory. But because of your lack of passion, the implication there is because of your lack of passion. You've been through so much because of your lack of passion. For what you do, for who you are, for where you are, your lack of passion made you only shoot three times and you stopped. That is symbolic of the people who say when it comes to this thing called Christianity, I'll do just enough. Just enough so I know I'm saved, just enough so I'm, I'm still in God, still in the kingdom, blah, blah, blah. You know, just enough. But here's the problem. The world is still moving forward. If you're standing still, that means you're falling behind. That's right. That's right. Come get this, Daniel. I'm done. But I need you tonight, those that are in here and out there. Your passion has got to come back. Most people that are in the church are not in love with Jesus like we should be. So now, one of the things I teach my preachers is don't just tell me what I need to do, but tell me how to do it. I'm going to give you one nugget tonight and we're going to dig into some more of the nuggets tomorrow. But one of the ways you get your passion back with Jesus is you spend time with him. Amen. Watch this. And you reflect on all of what he has done in days past. Yes, yes, I can hear a talk back church. Yes. Because, Sister Rosalind, there's no way you can stop and think about the goodness of the Lord to you throughout your life. Even through your difficult moments, you recognize that he's been good. Yes. There's no way that you can see that you walked away from him. I don't care about how sanctimonious you were. I don't care how sanctified you are. There have been days and there have been moments that you walked away from him. I ain't never left the church. No, you walked away from him. Even if it was for a moment, you walked away. Because you wanted to go cuss that person out. You wanted to go do. You wanted to go fight. You wanted to go shoot. You wanted to go stab. You wanted to go mess around. You wanted to grab that mm -hmm. You walked away for a minute. But the fact that he never walked away from you should be enough to help bring your passion back. Somebody just lift your hands right now and worship the Lord. 
And just say these words say, Lord, give me my passion back. Lord, give me my passion back. Because my passion is what's going to produce my press in this season. My passion is what's going to produce my press in this season. The reason why I'm going to go on a fast when the church didn't call it, because there's a passion in me. I want more. I want more of you. Less of me. Create in me. A clean Somebody say it right there. Create in me a clean heart. I want more of you. I want to have a clean heart. I don't want anything to block my passion. Have you ever? I'm going to show you what I'm talking about in this thing. Have you ever been dating one person or with one person and then somebody else introduced himself into your life and then all of a sudden because the other person introduced himself and they may have done something a little differently than the one that you were with did don't sit up here and look at me in that tone of voice y'all know I'm telling the truth so you you love this one but you started catching feelings for that one. Come on, do it. Y'all never been there? Come on. I don't care if it was all the way back in, in junior high school. You Come felt on. that thing. Yeah. <laughs> but watch. The point I'm trying to show you is when the other person came in and started doing what you thought that this one should have been doing for you, they started catching you started catching feelings for them and it began to block more and more of the feelings you had for the one who loved you genuinely yeah. Yeah. now y'all caught me yeah. so when our passions are distracted by the things of the world by the things of this life our passions are distracted by things the enemy throws at us it blocks off areas of our heart that should be passionate about Jesus And we have to say, Lord, give me a clean heart. Yes. I see it now, David. I see it now, David. Create in me a clean heart. Purge me. Wash me. I need a clean heart. Stop that music for a second. I need to do this and we're going to get out of here. There's an old song. It says, give me a clean heart. So I may serve you, Lord, fix my heart so that I may be used by you, Lord, I'm not worthy. Not in and of myself. Of all these blessings. But give me a clean heart. And I'll follow thee. I have decided yeah. to follow Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. What made me do it? My passion. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And then the old saints will say, the world behind me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The cross before me. The world behind me. Forgetting those things that are behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. 
No turning back. I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. Here to declare to you, my past is over. In you, all things are made new. Surrender my life to Christ. I'm moving, moving forward. Social Media Land, God bless all of you. I pray that you've been blessed by this word tonight. Listen, if you want to sow into the word of God tonight, you can sow by cash out. Dollar sign, D-R-F-L-O-N-G. In the church where I am right now, they don't have electronic giving, but some of you may want to sow into this word tonight. And so I've committed to this ministry to be accountable to every dollar that comes in concerning this revival. And if you, even if you're sowing online, I thank you for sowing online. It's not just going to come to me. We're going to take it to the people that it's supposed to go to, and they're going to divvy up the finance of this revival. We didn't have this revival for money. Please know that. We didn't have this revival for money. We had this revival because God called and ordained for this meeting. So thank you so much for watching, and I pray that you'll tune in tomorrow night for night number three of this seven days ablaze. God bless you.